All I know is that we were called out to your house and that uh, there was a body found. Um, <clears throat> sorry. No problems in the marriage? No. Typical marriage things, you know. This video contains the interview of a man who is suspected of killing his wife so he can be with their shared mistress. Desiree Sunford was a 30-year-old art teacher living with her husband, Scott, in Yakima, Washington. The couple had been married for almost 10 years. The relationship strong enough to survive Scott's military deployment. On the surface, they were a happy, committed couple. Most people were not aware of Paige Blade, a woman who both Scott and Desiree were seeing romantically. The arrangement seemed to be working for all parties until Desiree decided she wanted to end it. On April 7, 2013, police received a call from Scott Sunford, who was on his way home from a work trip. He claimed he was worried about his wife, who had not answered their phone. Their home had been broken into recently, and he was worried whoever it may have been might come back. When they arrived, the police were surprised to find an armed Sunford standing outside, saying that he was afraid to go in the house. Unsure of what they might find, officers entered, and at first, everything appeared normal. When they reached the bedroom, they discovered Desiree's body. She had been shot nine times and had obviously tried to get away. In a pool of blood, the perpetrator had left behind a single shoe print. Sheriff's office. Hi, ma'am. Um, this is Scott Sunford. I was robbed last weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I live at 320 North St. Hilaire. Anyways, uh, after the robbery, I had an ADT alarm system installed, and they put it on a one-week trial period where if anything went off, nobody would respond. And, okay. And uh, today at 324, 327, and 328, I had three census trips, and I've been out of town with family for a funeral. My wife was home. And I okay, did somebody break into the residence? I don't know. I've been out of town. I'm just on my way back and I haven't been able to get a hold of the wife, so I was just hoping somebody can come meet me out there. It's probably nothing, but I would feel better. Okay, hold on. Sheriff's office. Hi, ma'am, I just called a little while ago about the concern at my house. With okay, the what address would that be? 320 North St. Hilaire. Okay. Um, I just got home and the board that I have over my back door has been broken. So somebody has forced their way in again and I still haven't heard back from my wife. I need an officer here now. What do you mean you haven't heard back from your wife? I've been trying to get a hold of my wife since shortly after I left the Tri-Cities to head back home. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't come with me out of town. I had a family funeral to go to and she stayed home and I have not heard she from stayed her. home at, at this address yes okay so she's been at the house all day and she hasn't gotten a hold of me okay H have you checked with that... okay I understand what you're saying have you checked with friends and family to see if anyone's heard from her today no, not yet, ma'am. I just want an officer to get out here real quick and check this house and see what's going on. I understand that, but so no, you haven't checked with friends or family to see if anybody else has had contact with her? No, I was with my whole side of the family. Okay. I what? haven't called her mom. That's it. Okay. And what's your wife's name? Desiree Sunford. Yeah, the security stuff I got on here. Okay. Like I told you, my name's Sam Cole. I'm a detective here at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, I need to let you know that we're being recorded here, audio and video in this room. There's a camera right. up in the corner there. Um, I'll just read a little introduction here so that the people watching the tape later know what we're talking about. Following a statement concerns a shooting that happened on or about April 7th, 2013 at 320 North St. Hilaire Road. Yakima County Sheriff's Department case number is 13C04701. Today's date is 
think it's still the 7th. Nope, it's uh, April 8, 2013 now. The time is 002 hours. The location is the Yakima County Sheriff's Office in Yakima. Present during the statement are myself, Detective Sam Pearl, and Scott Sunford. What's your full name? Scott Ingvall Johan Sunford. Okay. It's and Norwegian. Okay. What's your address? 320 North St. Hilaire. Okay. And what's your age and date of birth? 31, July 19th of 81. Okay. Do you understand that we're being recorded right now? Yes. Do I have your permission to keep recording? Absolutely. Okay. What's your cell phone number? 509-855-3609. Okay. And who's your carrier? AT&T. AT&T. Um, you said you had iPhones. Yeah. And Since we're here at the Sheriff's Office, I'm going to read this to you. I don't expect you've probably ever been in trouble, but I'm sure you've seen this on TV. What's uh, that? You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in a court of law. You have the right, the right at this time to talk to a lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. If you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before question if you wish. You can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Okay? Do you understand each of these rights if I, as I explain them to you? Yes. Okay. There's one thing that does confuse me, though. What's that? Generally, if you read somebody their Miranda rights, that implies that they're under arrest. Uh, no, not always. It just means that we're conducting our investigation. I can tell you, you're, you're not under arrest right now. Okay. okay? Um, but we are here at the sheriff's office, and so and we're being recorded. So, as a matter of protocol, when we're conducting our, our investigations, we do read people their Miranda warnings. Okay. Oh, okay, that makes sense because at least this way you have it on record that I'm receiving my Miranda rights. In case there is an arrest later on, you can't say I wasn't read my rights and get released. Exactly. Okay. Okay, so you understand what's yeah. going on, and having those rights in mind, are you willing to keep talking to me now about what happened out at your house? Of course. Okay. Sanford is composed and shows very little concern for a man who believes something may have happened to his wife. He hasn't even asked about her, which sets off alarm bells for the detective. As much as I can. I mean, I can't help you too much. I wasn't there, but... Okay. Um, well, I wasn't either, and I just got here literally fact, a few minutes ago. So can you just kind of start from the beginning and tell me tell me what happened? Well, quite honestly, what you just your understanding of something else. There was a shooting. Right. Okay. What can you tell me? All I know is that we were called out to your house and that... Uh, there was a body found, um, and uh, it looks like the person had been shot. So that's where I'm asking you to jump in and help me fill in the blanks as far as what led us out there. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry. All right. Um, let's see, you said today is now the, what, 8th? It's the 8th now, yes, okay. just after midnight. On the 6th at uh, 10 in the morning was my Aunt Joy's funeral service in Pasco at their Kennewick at the city church. So uh, that morning, I guess that'd be Saturday, I, uh, I left the house at probably 8, 8.30. Okay. And that was the last time I was there before your, well, the last time I was in my house. Um, after I, I left there, I went down to the Tri-Cities. I uh, went to the service, and uh, from that point on, I was with my dad and grandpa, 
been, uh, oh, I don't know, the service probably ran on until about two or so, maybe less. I, uh, I called Des after the graveside portion and the luncheon portion. I was just kind of trying to get away from the old guys for a minute and mm -hmm. get up and walk around. So I went outside and I gave her a call and sat there talking on the phone for a while. And uh, I told her that the, my Aunt Mary and Frank were having a dinner out at their place at 6.30, so I was going to go out there and uh, I was going to be a little later than expected because the idea was I run up, go to the funeral, hugs, handshakes, turn around, go home. And, uh, you know, I had got some family from the coast and from all around that I hadn't seen in quite some time. And mm -hmm. a lot of that side of the family is kind of yuppies that I don't get along too well with. You know, I'm blue collar, mm -hmm. military mechanic, don't really hang out with the sharp dressed crowd too much. Yeah. So, uh, Luckily, the the ones that I liked made it up there, and uh, we got together for dinner, and it ran a bit late. It was probably 11 or so, and uh, I told her, you know, I it's, it's kind of rainy, it's windy, I'm tired as hell, long day, and they want to do a breakfast get-together in the morning. I'm going to stay here for the night. So I did, and... Uh, Went out there for breakfast and we were around for a while and I don't know probably probably around noonish or so we left that and uh, went back to my dad's house with him and my grandpa and uh, got together some old m guitars that were still at his house and some sanders and stuff because I got a kitchen table and some chairs for her not too long ago but the chairs needed to get refinished and of course, you know, new homeowners, we don't have too much stuff around there for stuff like that yet. Mm -hmm. So I hit up my dad and he gave me a few old sanders that he had and he's a woodworker. So uh, got those loaded up in the car, got the guitars in there and everything. And uh, let's see. Oh, I guess it was probably about 5.30 by the time we finally got out of my dad's house. 5.30 this evening? Yeah. Okay. It was a, a quick trip. <laughs> and, and he lives down he's in on, the Tri-Cities? Yeah, he's in Kennewick on 312 East okay. First Place. In spite of the fact that he has been informed someone was shot in his home, Sunford still does not ask about his wife or anything else about what may have happened. Instead, he goes into great detail about his visit with family members. And uh, we all left there and went down to Carl's Jr. in Kennewick and did dinner there. And I don't know, I would have to say probably about 7.30ish, I'd have to, I'd have to verify, it was 7, 7.30 in there is when I finally left. And uh, I went south on 395 and hopped on 82 to Yakima came up that way and um, I came in on the, uh, what's the name of that, Conilac Pass. Okay. Yeah, I took the old Yakima Highway up to Conilac Pass mm -hmm. and uh, during that drive on 82 I tried repeatedly, in fact, let's see if I can give you some times. Uh, my dad and my grandpa and I had been joking around about how Ah, oh, it's strange. Des hasn't called yet. You know, she hasn't uh, hasn't been bugging me yet today because she's a real stickler on the times. She schedules tight. Yeah. I adapt and overcome and kind of go spontaneous. So we've been uh, joking about that. And uh, let's see. Uh, all it's showing is the last phone call to her at 9:11 p.m. But, uh, That's the last time you tried to call her? Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm sure the phone records could give you more specifics if you need them, but uh, all along the drive I just kept calling her randomly, trying to get a hold of her, 
And I sent her a text even at one point, you know, why aren't you answering? And uh, just wasn't getting anything from her. And it was kind of freaking me out because, well, after the robbery last weekend, Deputy Wuchek had said that it looked like they had been interrupted or spooked or something and they may be back. So the next day we had a ADT system installed and uh, it was all kind of starting to build up and driving me a little nuts. Mm -hmm. And before I even made that turn off to the Yakima Highway, you know, maybe 45 minutes, half hour outside of the Tri-Cities, it was kicking in. And I kept thinking, you know, maybe I should just call somebody and have them go check on her. You know, maybe I should call the police. Oh, no, that's silly. She's probably in the shower. She's probably going to the bathroom doing something. Or she's outside because she'd said something about wanting to do some yard work. So I had to fix the tire on the wheelbarrow for her. So I uh, probably left the phone inside her. She's taking a nap. It's on silent. You know, I just kept telling myself everything's fine. And uh, I couldn't take it anymore. If I call and she doesn't get it, usually within 10, 15 minutes, she's picked up the phone and called me back, you know, what's going on. So uh, by this time, it had already been like an hour of me trying to get a hold of her with nothing. And I took her car to the Tri-Cities and left mine because, well, the last weekend when we were out of town was when it became illegal to be running studs, and I still got my studs on the charger. Mm -hmm. So it's like, ah, don't need a ticket. And Crown Vic's full of gas, charges on E and has studs. Come on. And so she convinced me to take the cop car. <laughs> so I, I took hers, and she said she didn't want to drive my car. She's like, I'm not even going to drive it. Don't even bother leaving my keys, whatever. Well, keys anyways. If you need it, take it. And uh, so I wasn't expecting her to be gone. I really didn't think she'd go anywhere, and with the way the wind was, I knew she wasn't going to take the bike anywhere. She's kind of a picky rider. And uh, so it was driving me nuts. And about the time I got on the Conowack Road-ish area, it, it was too much. I called, and the first gal I talked to, I told her, you know, I'm, I'm probably just crazy, but I checked my phone a little while ago, and... I got, uh, the, the alarm system was set to arm stay, meaning that she's at home. So that kind of implies that she was there mm -hmm. and the motion detectors turned off for the stay home and the motion detector comes on for stay gone. Well, when it's home, the door switches still work. Sunford keeps stressing that he was concerned yet justified the decision to put up seeking help several times, with the alarm showing that she was home but not answering her phone in combination with a recent break-in. That would have been a situation that would have most people calling immediately. And when I checked the phone and I saw that both doors had tripped within close time frame of each other, um, when I looked at it, it said front door open closed like 324. And then back door, open, close, 327, open, close, 328. So in my head, I put that together as she goes in the front door, out the back door, and then, you know, obviously shuts the doors behind her, and then comes back in the back door and shuts it. So she should be home. So why isn't she answering me? She should be in the house. Because that, that's in, out, in, you know? So it was really driving me nuts, and I had to call him. And I, I called in, and I talked to the dispatcher, and she said that uh, there were no units available. When one became available, they'd have him run by, and she asked, you know, about where he at. And it's like, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes from the house, maybe, if that. And uh, so I started heading up the road a little bit further, and I checked the alarm system again. And then it came back as like offline, cannot connect something. You know, it was being really weird on me. So I stopped over there uh, just on the other side of the highway on the Foucher Road and was it 24? Mm -hmm. Just on the, the south side of 24 on Foucher Road, there's a um, large gravel lot. I don't know if it's like uh, 
a semi feeding station where they you know dump the grain into the trucks or something but uh, I pulled in there real quick and I went through and closed out all my apps and rebooted the phone and then when it came back online it was fine and I went ahead and armed the alarm system and set it as armed away so the motion sensor was active thinking the alarm system is going to start chirping in the house Des is going to go over there and disarm it so next time I look at my phone it's going to be disarmed or she's going to hear it going off she's going to walk through the house and trigger the motion sensor and it's going to piss her off and she's going to disarm it and she's going to call me and be like what the hell are you doing don't do that crap that's annoying you know I was just absolutely certain that was going to happen and uh, it didn't and that scared me so uh, I kind of stalled a little bit I drove around waiting just giving her that chance to call me and uh, giving the deputy a chance to get free and get over there and uh, I headed to the house and I pulled down the driveway and I went down the driveway to the left and I fired up my spotlight and I pointed it at the back door. I noticed my charger's there, so she must be home. And I put the light up on the back door, and I noticed that the board that I had screwed up there from the previous break-in, the bottom quarter of the board had been broke off. And you could see the window was all messed up again. So immediately I got back on the phone with dispatch, and I told them, my house has been broken into again. My wife is not responding she should be home and she's not talking to me I need somebody here now and uh, I stayed there I kept waiting I kept waiting I couldn't go in I didn't know what the hell to do so I backed the car up a ways and uh, got on the phone and I, I called my friend Brian that lives out in Glebe he and I worked together we deployed together he's uh, it's a little motorcycle organization, man. Combat Veterans United mm -hmm. do the fundraisers for all the veterans' families. And uh, I called him up and asked him, "Hey, you awake? You dressed? Will you come over? I think I need you." And uh, I said, "Yeah, I'm in my sweats. Give me about 45 minutes. I'll be there." So I can't, couldn't go in there. So uh, I just waited, and after a little while longer, it was driving me nuts again. So I got on the phone, and I called up my dad. I told him, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know what the hell to do. Somebody's broke in. Dad should be in there, and she's not answering me. And uh, if she's... When he describes what happened leading up to the moment the police arrived on the scene, Sunford remains fairly emotionless. He claims he wasn't able to go into the house, but somehow he was able to stand outside with his gun ready to fire. His story is odd just by itself, but coupled with his delivery, it makes him look suspicious. Uh, I can't walk in and see anything. If something's wrong in there, I can't see it. But at the same time, if somebody broke in when she was there and uh, she got hurt or restrained and I was sitting out in the car sitting outside while she's scared and uh, I can't go in there to help her that was gonna drive me nuts so uh, I asked him you know hey what the heck can I do and it's uh, like well you got my 45 on you right yeah go in there so just as I was regaining myself, getting it back together, getting ready to do it, uh, the deputy from Moxie pulled up alongside me. And, God, it could not have been better timing. Because right then I was able to just say, hey, my alarm system's on. It's, it's off. <laughs> Here's my keys. Please. I can't do this. And, uh, yeah, I just waited there, and he walked around, and I, uh, I stayed at my car, had the spotlight on the back door still, had the door open, 
standing in the door, you know, using it for cover. Casey spooks him out the rear and uh, had my weapon ready but not drawn and uh, just stayed there waiting. And he, he circled the residence and he, he went up from around the back side and all along the picture windows and across the back by the master bedroom and bath mm -hmm. around the fr uh, fence onto the patio and in the front door. And uh, he came, I, it had been a little while, it seems like I should have seen lights coming on, I should have seen flashlights in the windows, something, and I got nothing. And uh, I didn't hear anything either. So I walked around and I, I wanted to see if the bikes were there too, because, you know, maybe, maybe she was bound and determined she had to run down to the store for something. She has her own bike that she rides? Yeah, I got her one of the uh, newer bike than mine. <laughs> I got her a 2010 uh, Sportster 883 Iron and uh, welded up a little cargo rack for the back of it and everything so she could use it for school. And uh, so I went into the garage real quick and I checked to make sure the bikes were there. Yeah, both bikes are there. My car's there. Her car's here. I look over and there's the deputy standing out on the front patio looking like he's on the phone or on the radio or something. He had a device up to his head. And uh, he saw me and immediately started walking over. And I didn't make it any more than about halfway to the gravel to him. When he said, you know, go wait over by the car, uh, I'm coming with you, let's go over there. Uh, I opened it, uh, he said, I opened the door and I, I called for Des and I got no response. I, I hollered, police department, nothing. I didn't see a dog, nothing's going on in there, it just doesn't seem right. I got back up coming. So we stood over by the car for a minute, just kind of talking, you know, shooting the breeze, and uh, all of a sudden out on the gravel road there on Rosa, I see uh, three cars coming, running, code three. <laughs> so uh, it's like, wow, they sent three of them, I was expecting one. Heck yeah, send ten. It's kind of important to me, man. Yeah. Bring them all. <laughs> well, the three cars get there, and they uh, they line up, and they tell me to go, go wait in my car. And uh, they went back in the, the front door there. And uh, then another car shows up. And I, I think it was the sergeant. It appeared to be shorter than the rest of the guys, graying hair. And uh, he kind of pulled in to the back and right, and not really falling in the line with the rest of the guys, and started heading for my back door. I told him, you know, hey, the other four went in the front door on the other side. Go to your right. And he kept going for the back door, and once he saw it was still closed, he looped around and went where I told him to. And uh, then another car shows up out there. I assume that would have been you, because they said that a detective was on the way. or uh, must have been a different detective. Oh, okay. So, yeah, then that car shows up, and next thing I know, they come outside, and one guy's patting me down. They're asking if I'm armed. I'm like, yeah, I just told the other deputy. Got a 45 right side inside the waistband, hip holster, you know. And uh, I had it in the car because, well, that's my dad's old gun. You know, I was bringing it up from the Tri-Cities. And... Sunford is able to speak jokingly, which doesn't fit with how concerned he claims to have been about his wife. With that much police presence on the scene, that should have been enough to alert him that something was gravely wrong. And it, when I was pulling into the house, I stopped up at the end of the driveway, right up there by the dumpster, about halfway to the house, and uh, went around, popped the trunk, and quickly slapped it on before I came down. So I was ready to go. And uh, so they, they took the gun and patted me down, and they pulled the Surefire flashlight out of my back pocket. I haven't seen that yet. And, took whatever else they wanted and uh, had me sit in the back of one of the cars and uh, one of the deputies told me that there was a deceased woman inside and that was all he would say about it he obviously I mean I understand he can't ID her because they don't know her 
So I was like, you know, about 30 years old, dark hair, heavy set. Yep. Okay. So uh, I, I got back over the police car. Oh, let me backtrack a little bit there as well. Um, before, as soon as I got to the house and I had the spotlight on the door, before I even called Brian or my dad, um, after talking to the dispatcher, she had asked, did you call any of her friends or families to see if she's with them, you know? So I got to thinking about it and pretty much all of our friends are our friends. You know, we don't really have her friends, my friends kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're couples, we're friends with couples, we're part of groups. It's kind of how we are. We're together. And uh, the only thing I'd think of was, you know, I'm sorry. Evidently it's not on silent. Yeah. Oh, it's my dad. He must be here. <laughs> so, uh, where's that? Oh, so I get on the phone and I call her mom. And I didn't want to scare her mom, get her worked up or anything. So I just asked her, you know, does talk to you today. I've been trying to get a hold of her and haven't gotten anything. No, no, hasn't talked to me at all. Okay, well, that's kind of strange. Uh, all right, well, that's all I wanted to know. And all she said was, okay, well, let me know when you get a hold of her. And that was the end of the mother-in-law contact. So I don't know if the deputy in Grant County's got a hold of her yet, but as of my last knowledge, she was, she still didn't know anything. Yeah, I, I don't know either. Okay. And uh, so anyways, back to where I was at, uh, they put me in the, the cruiser and, you know, from then on, it's just uh, officer popping in and talking a little bit and stepping back out. And that was about all. Okay. And when they described the female that they found inside, did that... They didn't. Meet, I, I meet told them. Come to you? Well, okay, you described it to them, you're right. And they said so, yes. Okay. That's probably her. Okay. So I guess as of now, I still can't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I believe that it was your wife that was found inside the house. Yeah. You said that you had your dad's 45 with you. Yeah, my dad was a sergeant with the Franklin County Sheriff's Department for many years. And uh, he had a old 80 series Colt Mark IV 1911 that uh, was his duty pistol for many years. And he uh, shot competitively for the police department and got all kinds of great awards for it and everything. And uh, after the deployments and everything, it's like, eh, heirloom. Yeah, that's serious now. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> did you keep any other guns inside the house? Yeah, I had a few. Okay, what kind of guns did you have in there? Um, let's see, I had, uh, well, let's go with Dez's. Um, when her grandfather died, her mom uh, left a few guns to us because I'm a military guy, I shoot. I got Des going on it, so she left a, a Remington Wingmaster. To a shotgun? Yep, and a Remington Huntsmaster, which is a pump action 30 out 6. And then uh, two revolvers made by Haas. Um, they were Sig Sawyer before Sig Sawyer got together. <laughs> what, cal what caliber are the revolvers? One of them is a 22 long rifle, and one of them is a 357. They're both single actions. Okay. Um, Des also had a carry pistol that was a uh, Ruger LCP 380. And then uh, on the top shelf of the closet of the of one of the guest rooms. Um, we're using it for a, a storage unit at the moment. It'd be the one um, as you're coming down the driveway to the right hand side mm -hmm. in that closet is where I kept them all. I don't have a gun safe yet. And uh, So all the guns that should be together in that one spot. Right, except for her carry pistol she would have. And then uh, my carry pistol is the one that was stolen. 
1911. Yeah, the Springfield Arms one. And uh, I haven't been carrying a while, that's why I let my LCP or my uh, CPL expire. It's uh, you know one of those things I've been trying to train myself off of. <laughs> Life's not that dangerous. Yeah. You said you were in the military? Yeah, 13 years. 13 years. Uh, and you were a mechanic? Mm-hmm. Did you get deployed in combat areas? Yeah, we had a couple deployments. Where at? Iraq. Iraq. Yeah, and um, I mean that just covers hers. For right. So you've got your own guns as well? Yeah, uh, my grandpa's. It's one of those things. He likes to give guns for presents. Yeah. <laughs> And um, so uh, up on the, the top shelf up there, I also had a, uh, a Jennings 9 mil that I got from a co-worker that couldn't get it to fire uh, consistently. It was running as single action. So I replaced a few springs in it and played with it. And first time I test fired it, the frame cracked on it. <laughs> so it got stripped apart and there's piles of the gun sitting on the top shelf. And uh, then as, as far as the rest of them is concerned, I've got my first gun ever was in there. It's a Ruger, or I'm sorry, Norinco JW-15. It's a 22 long rifle, bolt action. And uh, then I also had, well, 22s, we'll, we'll work our way up. I had a Ruger 1022 that my dad got me. Of course, that's a 22 long rifle, the only caliber available for it. And uh, let's see, probably next smallest would be uh, well, I had the 222s, an M1 Grand, the 30 6 M1 Garand, G A R A N D. Good man. <laughs> um, a model ninety eight Mauser, eight mil. Um, a Remington model ten twelve gauge shotgun. Sunford list the weapons that he kept in his home. They will have to be tested to see if any of them were the gun used to kill Desiree. Some have been stolen, and if they determine that the bullet was fired from a similar weapon, the timing will be suspicious. Uh, let's see, I had another shotgun in 22, but that's at the mother-in-law's. Um, the Colt that your officer has in his trunk. Oh, my baby. Um, 1898 Springfield Arms 3040 Craig. It's actually a K. You um, said that you tried to call Desiree on the way back from the Tri-Cities. When was the last time that you actually talked to her on the phone? The last time I talked to her was at the funeral service. On Saturday? Yeah. What time do you think that was? Um, all right, I'll see if it's still stored in here. You can just give me an approximate time for now. It would be close enough. We can. I'm just check trying it. to give it to you as, as specific as I can. 9 11. Yesterday, 8 36. Let's see, I would be looking for Saturday. Here we go. Oh, evidently I talked to her. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was only a couple minutes. I guess the last communication I had with her was 6 29 p.m for seven minutes. And the phone call at the funeral, uh, 
that's only three minutes. That's oh, she called me back because it got messed up. No. What's her phone number? Des's. Yeah. It's uh, five one nine, of course. Seven five zero. Oh eight six three. Do you guys have a home phone, a landline? No. Just use the cell phones? Just the cells. And um, is her phone through AT&T as well? Yeah, same account. Okay. So you talked to her yesterday evening for about seven <coughs> minutes, and did she indicate that anything was wrong or everything seemed okay? That no, time. it was fine. I mean, obviously it's a short mess or short phone call. It's only seven minutes, but uh, yeah, it was just a quick, uh, hi. Yeah, it looks like I'm gonna stay. It's okay. it's going kind of long. Love you. Talk to you soon. See you tomorrow. You know. Then you stayed at your dad's in Kennewick. Uh, no, I actually stayed with a friend, but uh, I let's see. What's the friend's name? Oh, her name's Paige. She's a mutual friend. Um, I guess it was probably about 10 that I got back together at, uh, at Mary's for the breakfast. 10 a.m. on Sunday morning? Yeah. And everybody else left out of there. At about the same time, we all all left slightly after them. Where's Paige live? She's up in Moses, Moses Light, or Warden actually, sorry. Same thing. <laughs> What's Paige's last name? Uh, Blades. Do you have a phone number for her? Oh, I'm sure I do. Although Sunford is casual about Blade and claims that she was a mutual friend, the truth is that Sunford and Desiree had an open marriage and both were seeing Blade romantically. Okay, she's a 501 also. 501? 509, I mean, sorry. Uh, 431. 2273. How far is Warden from the Tri-Cities? It's, it's about an hour. About an hour? Yeah. Which way? It's damn near as long as coming here, okay. but I had to go up there because of uh, the guitars that I had in the trunk. She's uh, she's a mutual friend of ours for a while. Oh, it's my dad. Or no, that's shit. That's the mother-in-law. At ten thirty. Okay. Sorry. Um. Yeah, she's been. I got two of my friends now that I've gotten started in the music. One of my friends I got started on bass and she used to play acoustics and uh, she was wanting to get back into it a little bit and so after collecting the guitars up at my dad's house had to go show her one that I thought she'd like so I got this little Kent um, it's got probably half as heavy as a normal guitar is it's just a real slim body narrow fretboard quick action just great beginner guitar so what when did you drive to Warden? Um God, probably about eleven. Eleven o'clock. Yeah, it was late. Night. What time do you think you arrived at Paige's house? I'd say twelve thirty ish. She had already um went and laid down. So I had to go wake her butt up. <laughs> I 
And then you said you, you got back to the Tri-Cities about 10 a.m. on Sunday for breakfast with your family? Yeah, pretty close. I think it was about 8.45 I left there, so that would put me there about right. Because I, on the way to Warden, I did the, uh, what is that, the Central Washington University Research Area slash Warden turnoff by the Scutney Reservoir, out Booker Road. Yeah, I'm not nice. familiar with that area. Yeah, well, I took that route to get to her house, and then on the way back, I came down uh, 17, gassed up in Othello, and then rolled out from there. Did uh, Desiree know that you were going to Pages? I don't know, honestly. It's not something you had discussed with her? No. No, Paige would come stay with us, and we'd stay with her. Was it uh, just a platonic friendship, or were you, did you have well, a sexual relationship with Paige? You know, I shouldn't go there because it's kind of rude. But, uh, well, Des didn't want me to say anything to anybody, but she kind of had uh, mixed feelings. And if I'll do anything, but that's one thing I can't provide for. So at one point, her and Paige had a, a little thing going for a while there, a little experiment. Okay, so, it was, so <laughs> it was Desiree and Paige who had the sexual relationship, yeah. and, but not you and Paige? Or we all did. Sometimes you and Paige too? Honestly, we all did. Okay. So you don't think it, it would probably would not have bothered Desiree to know that you were going to stay with Paige? No, and honestly, we didn't even do anything. I was out on the couch anyways because it's kind of one of those things where as long as we're going to do anything, we need to make sure we all are fine with doing anything. So, so it's everybody sound. stays informed. All right. So if there's no information or no previous arrangements made, nothing happens. Avoid hard feelings. So it sounds like you and Desiree had a pretty open relationship as long as the communication Generally, lines no. were... No? Generally, no. Just with her. Just with her, there was a special relationship with Paige? Yeah. Okay. How, how uh, had you and Desiree been getting along lately? Great. No problems in the marriage? No. Typical marriage things, you know, bickering and picking at each other for stupid little things. Yeah, no big fights though. No. Don't worry. Kiss and hug and go to night happy, or go to bed at night happy, you know. You, let's go back to the military experience. You spent 13 years in the military. Yeah. What branch? Army National Guard. Okay. And you were a mechanic, you said. Mm -hmm. and you did two tours in combat areas? Yeah. Okay. What, what areas of the world were you in? Um, Iraq, Germany. Uh, Kuwait. That's about it. Was all the combat in Iraq? Yeah. Okay. Did you see any direct combat? Yeah. Yeah. Did you suffer injuries in combat? Um, I got blown up a few times, but nothing really. Well, I got yeah. shot too, but I was wearing body armor. So it didn't cause any injuries. Shot and blown up. So you were really in the combat. You were close to the front line. Well, I mean, when you stop and think about it in the grand scheme of things, not really. No. How how did you get blown up? Was it like some kind of IED or? Well, okay. One of them was a VB IED. Working a checkpoint, car bomb blows up, people go flying. Um, another one was an RPG that hit near me, and kind of tipped me over, rung the bell a little. And then uh, three other ones were in vehicles while I was operating them, you know, roadside IEDs. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, so. that's rough. How, yeah. how, how are you coping with that? 
Well, according to the military, I'm what they call mentally resilient. Mentally resilient, so you're, yeah. you're dealing with it. You've talked to the right people at the military, and they feel like you're moving forward with your life. And, yeah. yeah. They said I deal with things quite well. I'm very resilient mentally, so. That's good. <laughs> Sanford may be counting on that excuse to explain his cool reaction to his wife's death. Personally, I've just found it's, it works really good for me to stand back, to step back away from the problem and look at things from an outside perspective and kind of displace yourself. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to handle things. Yeah. You get a little too close and too involved into it and it starts, starts to bug you, so... And I kept trying to just kind of stand off and shut up and regain myself and hold it together. It's still not real to me yet. How long have you been out of the military? Oh, I've only been out for, uh, I would say, end of November, 1st of December. So right it's, in there. It was recent. Yeah. Yep, I, uh, I broke my left femur pretty bad. I got some titanium in there, and I broke my back and broke my neck and broke, or I got uh, three bad joints in this shoulder and four in this one, so I can't really do any heavy lifting or, you know, working over my head too much. So they put me down as uh, non-retainable and just let my enlistment run out. So I didn't get to, get to boot or anything. All of that was the result of your injuries and the explosions, all those broken bones and well, plates. Well, this one, um, that one was from Fort Knox. Uh, the rest of it was overseas, but of course without an actual, I get shot, there's a hole. There it is, it happens. The rest of it, you know, I, but like when I broke my neck, um, I didn't even know I broke my neck. All I knew is... I hit the top of the truck really hard, it hurt, I saw pretty lights and stars, mm -hmm. and then I couldn't turn my head more than about that far each direction for a couple of months. And then uh, I got a haircut, and one of the Iraqi barbers are doing the shoulder rub thing and pop my neck, and next thing I know my head works fine again, so, great. <laughs> wow. And then after the fact, after I come back and... They're doing x-rays, they're like, oh, look, you broke your neck about a year ago. Oh, middle of my deployment. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> so what have you been doing since you got back? Or since you got released from the military in November? Well, since that, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nope. Unemployed? Yeah. Okay. Doesn't that we're actually just looking at starting up a, a business. What kind of business? Well, I figured since I'm a mechanic and... My entire military enlistment was as a recovery guy, driving M88 wreckers, that I'd be a tow truck driver. That makes sense. And uh, like I told her, you know, I don't want to get fired again. <laughs> yeah. So as long as I run the show, I can't get fired again. So, uh, yeah, we we're actually just looking into the business license and the incorporation and all that to try to figure something out. And I was just talking to my dad. He's got a friend of his down in the Tri-Cities that used to be a tools distributor with him that uh, started a towing company, I guess, about eight years ago. And so I figured, well, I've been running it for eight years. He's obviously doing something right. Maybe he's got a spare truck or two I can lease or buy off of him and yeah. get it kicked into high gear off of that. So was Desiree working? Yeah. She was an uh, art teacher at the Wapato Middle School. Oh. How long has she been working there? This is her second year. How long have you two been married? Ten in November. Ten? Wow. Yeah. Met in middle school, started dating in high school. And then uh, the first deployment came up and I got activated and mobilized and sent over to Fort Lewis and they let us go for uh, Thanksgiving, a little break there for a week. And when I came back on that little break, we, uh, we decided it'd be a damn good time to go ahead and do it. You know, we'd already been talking about it for over a year. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of waiting for the, the time and the money and everything to go and put together a nice shindig. And 
And it was like, you know what? It, it just doesn't make sense. I just want to get married now so that if something happens to me when I'm over there, you're guaranteed to be good. Or The detective asks questions about the history of Sunford's relationship with Desiree. They had been married for almost 10 years. This is enough time to form either a strong bond or a desire for change. You know, if, if I'm gone and you need to do something, you can. Like, for instance, she had to buy a new car while I was gone. Well, with us being married and her having a power of attorney, it made things a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of the, the thing that finally forced us to do it. it. Made us hurry up and get it done instead of beating around the bush. But, yep, it was fun. Yeah. Just sucked having to take off right away afterwards. Mm -hmm. But when I came back, combat pay built up in the bank. We took off. We went down to Oregon for like a week and a half, and horse rides down the beach, and ate at every place we could. And I showed her all my favorite places down there. And went and fed the sea lions together, and went through the little aquarium, and petting the little sea anemones. Yeah, a good time. Yeah. Sounds like it. Sounds like a great start to the marriage. You guys have Facebook accounts? Yeah. Is it under your names? Um, I is think hers is under um, her email, the Chevy Des one. She uses it a lot more than I do. The only thing I really do on there is just kind of log in and check on stuff that other people are posting. I'm not one of those guys that throws a bunch of pictures and comments up. Yeah, every time you... Yeah. Eat something, you know, right? Take a picture of it. Yeah. Like for instance, I I got an alert earlier today when my dad tagged me in a timeline something or another, you know, mm -hmm. for uh, lunch at Carl's. Really? <laughs> I used to get on her all the time because she'd go on there and she'd post something like, uh, you know, getting ready to take off to Moses Lake to go visit my mom for the week, and I'm like, oh, no! Come and burglarize Yeah, house. don't tell everybody we're gone. Quit it! Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't make much sense. So I got her broke of that habit about a year ago. She's been pretty good. You said you have ADT on the house now? Yeah. And they monitor? Yeah. So that they know when the doors open and close and everything? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can disarm it and arm it from your phone. Yeah. Okay. And you you stopped on Fauché Road, just south of 24, to check the alarm status, and you rebooted your phone. Mm -hmm. um, how long did that take, that process of rebooting and then resetting the alarm? Uh, well, the alarm was still on. It's just the app, it said it was offline or it could not connect or something. I assume that was com from coming through uh, uh, Conowac, yeah. yeah, from coming through the pass, temporary loss of signal, whatever. So I just rebooted it and almost immediately it started working again. And what was the status of the alarm? What did you call it? Um, for being, you're at home and yeah. so motion sensors? Yeah, there's, there's three statuses. There's disarmed, then there's home away. And that has the motion sensor on and the door sensors on. And then there's home stay. And that means you're in the house with the alarm armed and you're going to be walking around, so no motion sensors. Okay. And so it was on home stay when you first observed it. Yes. And then, but you changed it to home away thinking that she would hear it chirping or set right. it off or something. Or she would it. walk through the room and trip it. Okay. And hopefully that would get her attention and she'd get pissed at me and get on the phone and quit screwing with me. In theory, this would have been a good idea to check and make sure nothing was wrong before resorting to calling the police. Given why the system was installed in the first place, one would still think that nervousness would make thinking that plan through less likely than seeking immediate help. Because as long as it's been on this uh, little trial period, because once they install it, they give you that one week to get used to it. As long as it's been on that, uh, the installer was telling us, you know, sometimes couples, the first one up in the morning, 
we'll set it off because the last one that went to bed armed it for him real quick. Yeah. Or the first person to leave will arm it so that when the next person gets up, it'll go off. And yeah. it's like, you know, That's couples right. like to play with each other with that. So I was kind of doing that a little bit. Yeah. I'd log on there remotely and turn it on for her. I never did get her though. I left the house and I passed her on the road uh, one day and I logged on real quick and armed it knowing that oh, she's going to be home in like two minutes, this is going to be funny, she's going to call me. No, she gets home and disarms it before she even went in, ruined it. When you got out there, by the, it sounds like by the time you actually made it to the house, you were pretty frantic. Like, you felt like something had gone wrong. My stomach was churning. I was shaking. I, I had convinced myself by that point something had to be wrong. Okay. And so why not go in the house and check things out and make sure she's okay? Because I was afraid. What were you afraid of? When I saw that back door, I... I just couldn't decide whether whether I, I could deal with what I may or may not see. And what was it about the back door that you saw that really made you feel like there was a burglary at the house? Um, when I put up the, the board on it last weekend, it covered all the glass. The bottom, maybe quarter inch, or quarter of the plank, probably about that far up, was snapped off so I could see the glass exposed. So I, I knew something had been done. Okay, so I haven't been out there. So just by okay. what you're describing to me, this is what I'm picturing. Um, there you go. You had a, your back door had like a, a window in it and you had put a board over it because of a previous burglary that had happened um, the week prior Saturday between 2 and 4 is what we're suspecting yeah on, on April 2nd there was, was a burglary out there I think April 2nd would have been the Tuesday when I reported it that, okay that's when it was reported is right it April 2nd yeah what we were thinking was that the burglary happened Saturday between 2 and 4 p.m. Okay. and reason being um, I went up the street and talked to the neighbors, and the gal, uh, if I'm going up my driveway, the one on the right has an American flag and a Marine Corps flag up. I stopped in there, and she'd said that uh, Saturday afternoon between 2 and 4, she saw a truck drive down the driveway and back out of the driveway, and then a little while later, drive back down there and back out again. And uh, after walking around with Deputy Woodchuck and looking at it, it he said that it appeared to him that whoever was in there got spooked or, you know, for some reason they quit early mm -hmm. because all they managed to grab was a couple of computers and some broken iPhones and her iPad and, you know, my gun and just a couple of things. So it's not like they really cleaned this out. And um, so he said they may be back. That obviously put up red flags. That's why the next day I had ADT out there. Or actually, same day I had ADT out there. And uh, so after I um, I looked around there a little bit, it was driving me nuts. And I, I mean, I knew I had to do something with the door, but Desert already called the homeowner's insurance and they had a case open. They were already working on something. And uh, I went down to Lowe's, got an estimate, everything. And it's just time being, you know, to get it by. I ran a, a bead of caulk around the edge of the uh, window pan, uh, frame mm -hmm. and then put up the board over it to seal it in so we couldn't get bugs and drafts and stuff for the time being. Okay. And it was just one solid, like, half-inch pl piece of plywood, or is that...? Yeah, it was probably half-inch. It was that chip board okay. you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Just like a particle board type. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so when you arrived there tonight, the bottom part of that board was broken away? Right. The door being broken is a nice setup for his story, but in light of the murder and the timing, it brings up the question of whether the first break-in actually happened, or if it had been orchestrated 
just for this moment. And from where I was standing, because, I mean, the porch is out here, uh, my car would have been over here with the light pointed at it. Um, and the porch is, you know, a little bit of a cement pad, and then the steps. From where I was at, I couldn't see the plank. So I don't know if they broke it off and beat the glass out with it or threw it off to the side or what. But, yeah, door was shut, which I thought was pretty weird. And I just didn't know what the hell was going on. I didn't know if she got home and saw it and then freaked out and left or anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And so you were too afraid of what you might find to, to go in and check and see if she was all right? Yeah. I can deal with a lot of things, but I think that's outside of my realms. So your your thought was that she was there and there was something wrong with her and you couldn't deal with it? Yeah. Is that accurate? Because otherwise... She, guess, she would have called me. Well, I'm just thinking, you're uh, you're a big guy. You're a six four. Somewhere so, up there. Six four, two fifty. You've you've got a firearm on you. You've been in combat. I mean, you've done some serious shit that most people will never do. Um, so if anyone's going to be willing to go charging in the house and make sure their wife's okay, it would seem to me that it would be you. Well. It's not that I was afraid of anybody being in there. You know, I'd, I'll take on a hundred people for her, that's fine. Yeah. That wasn't the concern, it was her. You just don't want to see what may have happened to her. Yeah. And what did you think you might see if you went inside? Roll around a thousand of the worst things you could think of. The only reason I would have been forced to go in there, the only reason I could talk myself into it, was the fear that she still needed me in there. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. if she's, if she was in there and she was hurt and uh, scared or restrained, and I was sitting outside, just idly waiting, while she's in there going through that alone, that would have killed me. So if, if somebody else goes in there and it's fine, everything's empty, that's great. The other thing I can't deal with. You mentioned that you got a bunch of alarm hits on your through your phone at like 3 in the morning or 3. I didn't write the times down. Yeah, I'll bring them up for you. The alarm is monitored. Kind of. And you could see where she, you, you had thought she went in and out and then back in. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it doesn't stay connected. It automatically times out after three hours of inactivity. So if I'm not screwing around with it every three hours, it shuts off. And it's set up to her email and her phone number. So if it goes off, she gets an email and a text message saying it went off. Mm -hmm. I don't. Evidently, the front door is open right now. Once it finishes doing its thing here, I can show you what I'm talking about. So it still says connecting for remote. Mm -hmm. Did you guys install any surveillance cameras or anything with the security system? No, I asked her about it and I asked the ADT guy about it because I wanted to get one on the garage pointed up the driveway. Mm -hmm. So if anybody came in, I could at least get the vehicle license plate, maybe a shot of them. But that was what I was worried about. And uh, the ADT guy said to, that he used Tiger Direct, just you know, go online, order some up, and add them because the ADT ones are stupid overpriced and evidently they're not that great. So we were, we were window shopping for some. It was in the works. It was going to happen. Well, while we're sitting here waiting, 
front door. Okay, 9.24 p.m. was when it was open tonight, and it's been open since, apparently. Closed, yeah, see, 3.27 a.m. Now it's just updated. Evidently, they've opened and closed it again. But, yeah, 3.27 a.m. yesterday, it was closed twice, so that tells me that it was the vibration sensor, not the actual opening. 326. The detective points out that Sunford had plenty of training to prepare him for such a situation and that he would have been perfectly capable of going into the house to check on Desiree. Sunford tries to excuse himself by saying he couldn't face what may have happened to her, but it comes across as a very weak reason. 324. So it looks like a flurry of activity around 0324. Yeah, 323. And then 617 p.m. And 743. Oh, sorry, I'm upside down. <laughs> 917, 923. So that's probably, you know, letting a dog out and back in. What kind of dog is it that you guys have? She's a shepherd mix. She's a chipped dog. She came from the pound, so they put one of those tracking chips in her. Her name's Ada. Uh, she, I, she just went into the vet. I think Des said she was 42 pounds when they weighed her. And we adopted her from the Grant County Humane Society, so they would have her file. Okay. And, uh, okay. Is, is Ada pretty protective? No, she's only barked at a couple of people. She's just a cuddly lap dog. And back door. 1127. That would have been you guys. So, 328 a.m. yesterday. Multiple triggers. 327. It was opened. 328, it was closed. So we're looking at right around 3.30 in the morning. Okay. And living room motion. I don't see anything on it. Only trouble and alarm events are available for this sensor. So nothing. So I understand the... Uh, sequence of events. Y you were, you left Yakima about 0830 on Saturday and drove down to the Tri-Cities yep. and you were there all day at the funeral with your family mm -hmm. and then um, yeah, around 11 o'clock Saturday night, you drove to Warden, mm -hmm. and then you left Warden at about 8.30 in the morning on Sunday, is that right? Yeah, 8.30, 8.45. Yeah. Drove back to the Tri-Cities where you had breakfast mm -hmm. with your family and hung out with them all day. Yep. And then headed back from the Tri-Cities to Yakima this evening. Uh, around 8 o'clock, 8, 8.30. About eight o'clock, roughly. What whatever driving time to where you were back in the Yakima area, making phone calls um, around nine o'clock, roughly, when you started calling the sheriff's office, and you called your friend Brian to see if he could come over. Um, you tried calling Desiree 
at 9.11 p.m. Okay. Is that a pretty accurate account of your movements? I mean, not to the yeah. minute, of course, yeah. but... Um, pretty damn so, good timeline. So, did you drive back to Yakima for anything in between that time period? No. Okay, so you were Yakima, Tri-Cities, Tri-Cities, Warden, Warden, Tri-Cities, back to Yakima, no trips to Yakima in the meantime. No. Okay. When questioned about his movements, Sunford becomes unusually quiet. And so we can check cell phone records to confirm that and, and show where the tower hits and it should give a, a pretty cl clear picture of where you were and when yeah. every time your phone registered. Absolutely. I can't think of any time I shut it off other than that one reboot right by Fauche. I don't think I even rebooted any during the weekend. So the the phone was on most of the time. Yeah, all the time. What um you said that Desiree's Facebook is under Chevy Des? Yeah, her email. Who's her email through? Yahoo. So it's Chevy Des at yahoo.com? Yeah. I don't know if you meant to write it that way or not, but that looks like an R. C H R V Y. At least it does to me. Yeah, well, that's my penmanship. Okay. As long as you know it's an E. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, my E's get a little screwy sometimes, I guess. No, oh, I understand. Mm -hmm. My hands are pretty beat up. I can't write unless I'm looking at it. What's your Facebook under? Uh, mine's under my Yahoo as well. What's your Yahoo? S. Sunford. No cap space. There's nothing weird. Where would uh, Desiree, you said that the 380, that Ruger LCP is her carry gun? Yes. Where would she keep it when she was at home? Nine times out of ten, it's either on her, uh, the headboard, like above her pillow next to the alarm clock, or in the little cubby right above that. There's a couple of little double doors that open up. Or even above that, on the very tip top of the headboard, next to the lamp, but it's it's always right there. Being that she's a teacher, she can't exactly keep it in her purse and take it to school. So. And you said that your relationship with her is solid. You guys haven't had any problems lately. No. One of the officers uh, mentioned to me that they were already getting on and looking at Facebook statuses and there was a status update that said something similar. I haven't seen it, but it was like uh, getting a divorce is harder than getting away with murder or something along that line. From who? It was on one of YouTube's Facebook pages. Hmm. I don't know. Is there, is there any reason that she would mention divorce? No, not unless it was jokingly, because uh, we were fine. You guys were good? Yeah. There was no arguing? No. Nothing serious. Yeah. Just stupid little stuff, you know? Were you guys fighting about stupid little stuff during the time frame that you were gone? No, I was gone. We well, couldn't have been fighting. In between. Couples can fight over the telephone, though. No. 
Sunford fails to mention that Desiree was wanting to stop their relationship with Blade. He obviously knows just how bad that fact will make him look, but hiding it and waiting for them to find out on their own only makes him look worse. Before you leave, and I mean, it's totally understandable if, you're, if you did. I mean, because married married couples fight, no, and so it's no. better uh, t to just tell me now. Be because no, Friday, Friday we had a little bit of a fight for like probably 15 minutes, maybe half an hour. And then a couple hours later, we sat down and we cuddled on the love seat and talked for a while. And What was that fight about? Um, pretty much because of my memory. <laughs> Why? What would you forget? My short-term memory is horrible. You can tell me something one minute, a couple minutes later it's gone. And, uh, you know, oftentimes I'll, I'll mess up and think I told her something because I was thinking to tell her something. You know what I mean? <laughs> it makes it in your head but not out your mouth. What, uh, what were you supposed to tell her that you didn't? I don't even remember. Her mom was right there. Her mom was there? Yeah, I just barked at her a little bit. But then you guys made up right away? Oh, yeah. Okay. No other recent fights? No. Did uh, Desiree have problems with anyone else? Was there anyone else that she has fought with recently or that you can think of that might want to hurt her? Nothing. I mean, who hates an art teacher? It's an elective. Everybody that's in there wants to be there. So she hasn't had problems with anyone? No. Neither one of us. Other than her um, relationship with Paige, was, did she have any other sexual relationships that you know of? No, a few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, before we were even married, she cheated on me at one point with another guy, but, uh, you know, that's long since over with. When you were dating, she yeah. had an affair? She, has she had any affairs since you've been married? No, not that I know of. She hasn't been good. Okay. In the week since the burglary, have you seen anyone suspicious or around the area or around the house? No, all I got from that was... Uh, the gal at the end of my driveway to the right with that American flag and the Marine Corps flag told me that uh, that Saturday between 2 and 4 there was a gray pickup and that's it. Okay. Um, since then we had the ADT guy come out and we had the mother-in-law come out and I don't think I've even had any of my friends come out there we haven't been there long, so it's not like there's that many people that know where we live. Okay. Was there any uh, life insurance on Desiree? I don't think so. I had a lot of life insurance on me and some on her, but when I lost my job, it went away. Who was it through before? Um, SGLI and SSLI. I set it all up so that if anything happened to me on any of the deployments, she'd be good. SGLI, and what was the second one? SSLI. It's Service Member Group Life Insurance and State Sponsored Life Insurance. They're both military only, so they've obviously went away as soon as the whole enlistment status changed. So as far as you know, there isn't, aren't any policies in effect right now? No, I don't think so. Because when she signed her teaching contract, I had such good coverage on us that I don't think she would have opted for any. Okay. Is there anything else that you can think of that I should know about? can't think of anything.
Um, we already gave the the deputies the uh, serial number for the iPad, so they could try to track that. Um, she did tell me that she had it locked, so they couldn't boot it up, log in, get on a Wi-Fi network, and get hit that way. Uh, did, did she have another computer at home still that she could be on? Yeah, I, I gave her uh, one of my old laptops for her classroom, and she brought that in from the classroom. Okay. And that was sitting on the desk in front of the computer's monitor from where the desktop was. And that one was a little, uh, it was a Dell Inspiron 1505. That was her... Uh, a little work computer. And she brought that in so that we could do the emails and everything to deal with the robbery. Insurance is often a motive, but in this case, it isn't a contributing factor. All of the electronics owned by Sunford and his wife will have to be searched. While Sunford may have avoided putting anything incriminating on his, Desiree's might hold some clue to something being amiss in the relationship. You mentioned that you shut your phone off to reboot it. Um, is it very common for you to have to turn your phone off? Every few days or so it starts kind of jamming up. It does this thing where you hit the home button and it'll work and then other times you hit the home button and it won't work and you gotta sit there and pound it for 10 minutes and it just jams up just do a quick restart and it generally starts behaving better. Okay. I missed a phone call here just a second ago. So I need to double check uh, what that what uh, they were calling about. So well, I could use a, a little break to the facility myself. My okay. bladder's getting this, this would be a good time to take a break then. Okay. Uh, the time right now is zero one twenty one hours, and I'm Detective Sam Pearl. So I assume we're coming back in this room? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, I saw you gathering up all your stuff. I wonder if I'm just do the same. Oh, no, no. Yeah, okay. you're fine. You can leave it sitting right there. While Scott Sunford was a prime suspect, it wasn't until the police received a tip that Paige Blade was pregnant that they began to see a clear motive. The investigation stalled for almost a year, although they watched the pair closely. An anonymous tip, who later turned out to be Blade herself, gave them the lead they had been hoping for. She gave them a name that they had never heard in connection with the case, Marty Grimser. Marty and Paige were best friends, and a week before the call, he confessed to killing Desiree. The week before the call, Scott and Paige argued over his new love interest. Afterward, Marty asked if he wanted to take care of the new woman as he did to Desiree. With Blaine's assistance, they attempted to catch Grismer in a sting operation but he was too nervous to say anything incriminating. A few weeks later, Marty's workplace contacted the police. They found a plastic bag of gun parts. The bullet casings matched those at the crime scene. When the police searched his office at work, they found items belonging to Desiree. They quickly obtained a warrant to search his home and found a pair of shoes which perfectly matched the prints left behind at the crime scene. Marty Grismer was charged with first-degree murder. The police believed that Grismer killed Desiree at Blade's request because he was in love with her. Grismer was tried and sentenced to 15 years in jail. The police still believe that Scott and Paige were involved in the murder. However, they have no evidence, and Marty alone stands convicted. He entered an Alford plea, which meant he never confessed, but agreed that the evidence outweighed him. And that's the end of today's video. If you liked what you watched and want to support the channel, hit the like button and check out my Patreon link in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.